Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 109 of the American Muslim Experience. Um, I am your host, Pervez Ahmad, and I am joined by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Sanakam Pervez. Sanakam, everybody. Hope everybody's doing good out there. And uh, Pervez, how you doing? We're doing well. We we are here. Uh, I can't believe it's the second week of, uh, of February. I think we're recording a day before... Um, uh, Valentine's Day and two days before <laughs> President's Day, but uh, yeah, all is well. Um, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah, things are good. Um, we we actually had an it was, it's a it's a long weekend for work, and and then on top of that, work gave us something called the Recharge Day yesterday, which is uh, basically what they're they're realizing like nobody's taking vacations because they have nowhere to go, right? So they essentially made like a company wide day off um so that way we get we get encouraged to take the day off and everybody takes the day off so nobody feels guilty for for being at home and not checking their email so that was yesterday it's pretty cool actually so i'm getting a nice four-day weekend out of this uh this weekend yeah yesterday as in friday then uh yeah that's right that's right uh sometimes i forget that this isn't uh real time so yeah um this is friday the 12th do I have to draw you a map about like the difference between radio and podcast? Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't be dumb. laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. So, uh, you know, I, I've been, I've been going to Juma again now that places have reopened. So I'm, I'm enjoying that aspect of it, that part of it. Um, mm. uh, I know you and I have talked about it off mic. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a process now you you know, you have to go and register a spot and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, having that that at least that one part of that community life that i used to know mm-hmm. <laughs> um return is 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 it has been nice so uh um yeah uh, i haven't definitely. i haven't gone to a juma in a year a year you are, fact, publicly, I, you are publicly confessing to a uh to a sin omar how dare you <laughs> yeah right right no no so, no no, I'm, I'm no, no i um i went i remember going last time uh and it was like right around the time when they were saying you know, should you or shouldn't you go? And I remember my, my friend who I normally go with was like, okay, I'll see you. <laughs> like we had lunch together and he's like, okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'll see you later. I'm not going. I'm like, and you know, I think I'm going to go this time. And it was one of those situations. Then that turned out to be the last Juma. Yeah, they're doing it. I mean, at least in our area, Omar, they're doing it uh, outdoors for the most part. So mm-hmm. most of the places I know of are doing it outside and it's um, yeah, it's super socially distanced. People mm-hmm. wear masks. They encourage you to make wudu, um, you know, at home, and they may, and they encourage you to do sunnah at home. They mm-hmm. don't even do they don't even do Juma announcements anymore. So there's mm-hmm. no announcement. So it's like you know you're in and out. Uh, it's super. Um, uh, they, they've at least the, like I said, the ones that I've attended has been have, have been very organized, mm-hmm. and uh, it's been it's been encouraging. And and they're at the mercy of whatever the county is doing. Um, so if the counties allow for those type of gatherings, they're doing them. Otherwise, they're not. Even though. Um, the Supreme Court of the state of California um, actually uh, said that Newsom's ban on religious organizations um, or, or the ban doesn't apply or any type of sort of limitations uh, don't apply to religious institutions. That's what the Supreme Court ruled. So it's interesting that the Muslim community has opted, at least for the most part, again, I, I you know, uh, there are variances that I know of here, right here in Fremont, in fact, that have always stayed open and, mm. and, and have continued to doing Juma indoors. Oh, um, wow. But, yeah, oh, 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 plenty, plenty. Um, but for the most part, as I said, it, I, you know, at least what I've seen anecdotally, again, is that the Muslim community has adopted even a more sort of conservative approach, even though, as I said, the Supreme Court said that, you know, Newsom's uh, restrictions don't apply to religious organizations. And, you know, and the logic being that, you know, that 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 the uh, that the restrictions were being applied, kind of, um, you know, like I mean, it was just sort of haphazard, right? I mean, you were saying that you could like bars could be operational, or not mm-hmm. bars, but like liquor stores, but not churches, yeah. but grocery stores, not religious organizations, so on and so forth. So it's going to um, be. It's, I don't envy the governors. It's going to be interesting. I don't. Because I don't. Yeah. G- Gavin Newsom, who I who I like a lot, he's he's become pretty. Um, Kind of a, a light, lightning rod, I guess, is the term. Well, like, either you love him or you hate him, and the oh, people yeah. hate him. Even in California, really hate him. You know. Oh yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. kind of crazy. No, no, no. Definitely. I think uh, we're seeing that. I think may- maybe across this country, where 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 where, because so much of it has been, so much of the COVID response has been uh, delegated to states. Um, 
in the absence of like real federal guidelines. I mean, I think we're seeing some of that change with the new Biden administration, but certainly with the Trump administration, it was almost entirely left to the states that the state governors then became kind of like you said, the lightning rods or the um, they kind of engendered real passionate either feelings for or against how Mm -hmm. they were handling you know, how, yeah. how they were handling COVID. Um, so, for example, I don't know how people in Florida view DeSantis, but, you know, from the outside, you know, DeSantis kind of, they decided to reopen up everything, no mask mandate, pretty much through the life of the pandemic. Um, and for the most part, Governor Abbott in Texas, but, mm-hmm. I, you know, so, but the same, whereas, yeah, you're right. We, we here in California uh, are, are uh, yeah, we're, we're still relatively more locked down than other parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and but but we still say what you will about California being like blue. There's there has its fair share of uh, oh, no. conservative anti anti uh, maskers and all that, and they have been super angry, super repulsed by by Newsom. So it's going to be interesting, interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, I've heard talk of recall and so on. Yeah. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. <laughs> um, crazy, hey, crazy. so so yeah. I, I wanted to share something kind of a mm-hmm. personal um like one of those life events that 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 it, you know that you that give you a moment to reflect and think about. So, yeah, yeah, sure, go for um, it. And, and I'm doing this live. And in fact, you and I haven't even talked about it. So you haven't, you haven't prepped me on this, huh? No, I haven't prepped you on it. Oh, wow. I, I kind of okay. wanted your live kind of your sure. thoughts as well. So, so a, a dear friend uh, of mine from, from, from Houston, um, um, actually suffered a massive heart attack. Um, really? yeah. So, um, Adel, I'm sorry. Um, Great. Oh, remember Adel? you're kidding. He's like our age. He's two weeks younger than I am. Omar. Oh man! Uh, he and I shared a November birthday, um, and still do. And he's is he okay? Uh, yeah, long story. Yeah, he's he's okay. doing great. He's back okay. at home. He's been back at home, but it was obviously a very very scary episode. Um, what he he was experiencing symptoms that he sort of dismissed as indigestion or uh-huh. maybe some mild angina pains, you know, chest pain, but but nothing significant. Short shortness of breath. So. Um, you know, uh, so th- I think they went to what are those th- those emergency n- like not the emergency room, but the uh, the urgent care facilities, and they're like, no, 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 no you don't, Emer- you, you don't need oh, to he be just here. Went to urgent care, and he, they sent him to emergency. He just went to urgent care, and they said, no, you are having a significant cardiac oh, episode. Um, and so they rushed him to the ER. Uh, he lives in, in the Dallas area. They rushed him to the ER, and uh, they 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 automatically like one they 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 found that one of his arteries was one hundred percent blocked. Mm-hmm. So they did a uh, they did a, a stent a procedure. Mm-hmm. So they installed a stent, and um, he was supposed to be in in the ICU for another forty eight hours. Um, um, but luckily, you know, he progressed and he was out within twenty four. Oh, and of okay. course, they so continue to they continue to check in and monitor. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah I mean, he, like you said, Omar, my age, a couple of years older than you, not even. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, it just gives you those kind of. I mean, and it's young by I think even just net general standards, but. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have someone who's very, very close to you. I mean, I, or Adil and I go yeah, way, yeah. way back. I for mean, sure. You know, I remember. 89 trip, I remember meeting him, man. Yeah, you. And then for me, like when we first moved to that to that neighborhood in in in, uh, in, in Houston, Mission Bend, um, that was one of the few houses. I, th- I think for a while there was the only house my mom used to allow me to ride my bicycle to because mm-hmm. she knew exactly or she knew that I knew the route there. And I was in second grade, maybe third grade. So that's how long I, you know I go back with that family, um, you know, and you know, they, they lost their mother like a few months yeah. ago back in September. So obviously dealing with a lot of that and then to have this kind of, you know, um, but he, but he's okay. Real, real sounds concern. like, sounds like they, they got it in time. You know, they addressed it before. Yeah. Um, like any, you, said, you know, it just, it just allow, it just gives you, I, I like, I don't know if that's happened to you, but it just gives you kind of a sense of your own, uh, you know, to pause and kind of reflect on your own mortality and your own, health obviously and, and those type of things but uh i thought i'd share that and uh, mm. it's always obviously a scary episode for the person you know um who experienced it but as i said as an observer or someone close to that person you know you obviously can't help but be introspective about your own situation so i guess just you know yeah, there's a wow. lesson there you know take care of yourself take care of your health uh you know get get frequently checked up and uh, yeah we, we we sometimes uh at least, at least for me, I, I, I forget. Like I'm, I'm, I'm north of 45, so I'm closer to 50 than I am 40, which is scary. Mm-hmm. Um, but oh, not scary, but you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's a place I uh, that I still find surreal. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, we're yeah. getting up there. 
Oh, well, I'm glad he's okay. That's that's uh, that's that's good news. Um, hopefully, you know, anytime something like this happens, you take it as a an opportunity to to just get 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 healthier. I remember my dad hadn't gone to the doctor for 25 years until he had his heart attack when he was in his 60 early 60s. He literally had not gone to a single doctor. I would say that's years. probably yeah abnormal. Like I would say that's probably an it's extreme. Know, not extreme. It's it's not yeah, typical. Yeah. Yeah, not typical. Yeah. Oh, not atypical, or it's, no? I would it's say extreme. it's not. It's not typical at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. But but in terms of what he did with it, he he actually you know in the past fifteen sixteen years since that happened, he's been pretty much on top of doing what he needs to do, right? Um, even though that was a super dicey situation, he almost didn't make it. But since then, at least now he goes. You know, he's he's made he's made up for all those missed doctors' visits and then some. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, but no, you're right. It's yeah. like it's a reminder to to everybody to, especially those of us with de- desi and South Asian genes, right? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 to be fair, I mean, Adil, you know, a few years ago, he took he started taking his health very seriously and started eating right, exercising, did all the you know, all, mm. like marked off all the boxes. Yeah, uh, all the check marks were there. Um, but you know, and so it's it's scary nonetheless yeah um but yeah like you said uh i am i am delighted and thrilled that everything is okay and he's doing you know really well and his numbers mm-hmm. were looking really good um he just sent actually an update to 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 the to to, to, to our uh little uh group yeah. uh, friends uh whatsapp group today uh giving mm-hmm. an update saying that everything's looking good but uh okay anyway um yeah, yeah. so i wanted to kind of reflect on that live on air as it were and um uh with our audience but um we are delighted uh, uh to, to to really um uh for our first episode in february to be uh with uh our guest for the show so we are delighted uh, to have uh, Im- Imam Ibrahim uh, on the show. Uh, Imam Ibrahim served as the founding Imam of the Mosque of Omar Inc. Uh, on the Chicago's far Chicago's far south side, which was the uh, Roseland community. He served as Imam there from 1973 to 2009, um, and then from 2009 to 2018, um, Imam Ibrahim operated out of Mas- uh, Masjid Khalilullah, which is also in Chicago's South Side, but the Morgan Park community. Um, and uh, more recently, he has relocated once again and is looking to resume activities uh, in Ramadan, um, uh, God willing. Um, Imam Ibrahim was a participant in the first Imam training program in Saudi Arabia in 1978, which was sponsored by the Ministry of Higher Education. And for those who have been listening to the show long enough, um, that was a program that Imam Siraj Wahaj, when he was on the show, referenced. Definitely want to get into that. Um, And then uh, Imam Ibrahim served as director of the Transitional College Preparatory, TCP, uh, at Chicago State University from 1992 to 2009. Um, This was a design extracurricular program that that prepared first-generation college university-bound students for the realities in making that transition from high school to college. Um, That is all to say that we are just delighted to have Imam Ibrahim on the show. Welcome, Imam Ibrahim, to the show. Uh, shukran, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum and greetings to all of the listening audience. And I'm pleased to be here as well. I hope I'm not too loud. I'm, I have to get familiar. No, you are, you are perfect. Cool. Okay, no, no, so. you are perfect and you sound great. Um, I wish the listeners could see you as well, but for right now, they can only listen to you, but that's good enough. Um, yeah, we are just really thrilled. It's really an honor to have you uh, on the podcast, uh, Imam Ibrahim. Um, at, just as a personal note, um, I know you and I have met at Tetleaf, um, and we can certainly talk about that. Um, uh, I, I follow you on social media where you just share so much of the treasure um, of knowledge and history that you've experienced uh, within the uh, Muslim American community. Um, and so I'm just delighted to kind of dive into that. But I guess before we get there, uh, as we like to sort of call it, we, we like to start off by talking about your origin story, your background. Um, so maybe you could kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, where you were born, where you were raised, and um, okay. kind of some of those early years. Yeah. Well, I was, Mr. Mark Mahim, I was born at uh, Cook County Hospital. Chicago, Illinois, uh, September 25th, 1947. The third in a family of eight children. And my primary upbringing was in the public housing community called Alt-Gale Gardens. 
Far south side Chicago. I graduated from Carver High School at the age of 16. Uh, without any consequence necessarily negatively, but I was I was good at school. Uh, I can see that. 16 would, would have been early even back then, right? Yes, it was. Yeah, I, but I also went to summer school. I took advantage of every opportunity to elevate myself in school and to uh, succeed or to excel in those levels. But I now, heard would you a, say, excuse me, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, like, was that, I mean, was that value of education kind of instilled from, from your parents or was that just something that came innately within you? I think it was more innately. Uh, well, being in a family of brothers, there's a competitive thing that's always there. I couldn't beat nobody physically, but I could outthink them and outsmart them and be the one that they come to to get help with homework or to answer questions because I liked learning more than anyone else in my immediate uh, environment. And that's just who I was. And when I saw how that could apply at school, see, and another advantage was my uh, grand, my paternal grandfather owned a grocery store on 26 in Dearborn, across from Dearborn Homes and uh, I forget the name of the school. I think it was William School. And I'd go down there every weekend. I'd work the cash register and customers would be amazed. They'd be counting the change in their hand and say, you got enough. Oh, you don't have enough. Well, how do you know? I said, I counted it. It's, so I, I, so I, I just took advantage of every opportunity to 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 be better at yeah. learning and numbers and reading and writing. And it's, I just enjoyed it. But by the time I was 16, I graduated. Uh, then my hormones were acting up. And one of the fellows from the Navy came home and told me his tales of going from port to port. I said, that's for me. I joined the Navy. <laughs> my mother my mother would not sign for me. So I couldn't go in until I was 18. But I went in a week after my 18th birthday. You joined and, the Navy. Yeah, and I ended I was an electronics technician. I got with the wrong crowd and in Japan ended up getting taken by the police and having to be picked back up by the Navy uh, and brought back to the base. Long story short, they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, well, uh, I'll take out. And that was after one year, 11 months, and 23 days, they let me out. But they told me I would get a general uh, uh, discharge. But they gave me a, a, a other than honorable discharge. So I okay. got out with a kind of stain on me. But at the time, my congressman, Ralph Metcalf, I went to D.C. and I met with him. And told him my particular situation, and he appealed to the Office of Naval Affairs, and they gave me a, they changed my discharge. So I used that, got my uh, educational benefits, went to got, went to school for a while, but I was majoring in the benefits. I wasn't trying at that time to take advantage of the knowledge. I just wanted to get whatever uh, uh, resources I could get from the government, establish myself, and move on. Before you're back period, in you're back in Chicago around at the age twenty at this time. Yeah, I was. I got out. Yeah, I was about twenty, and between the ages of twenty and twenty-two, when I was getting the uh, situation straight with the government, and I accepted Islam November fourteenth, nineteen seventy-one. So, so before we get, so sure. you said, okay, so you embraced Islam in nineteen seventy-one. You said correct. Okay. Um, Tell us a little bit about, if you could, even prior to joining the Navy, um, a little bit about Chicago. So we haven't had someone, uh, just, just to give you some background, Imam Ibrahim, who, who, who sort of grew up and, 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 and came of age in, in, in the south side of Chicago. So, okay. um, and, and I know the south side specifically, Chicago in general, but specifically the south side, just so rich with history. Um, so maybe if you could give us a little peek into what, that was like what what the social milieu of of, of uh i guess well, would be I, was 60 in the Chicago. I was in the streets i was in the streets and when i say that i mean that life was outside for young people and uh living in old Gill gardens which which was like 130th i happened to take in with a group from around 75th and king drive and that's what it was you you deal with neighborhoods and we it was music uh regular social activity on weekends most of us had part-time some of us had full-time jobs 
Uh, it was, I mean, I can't say that it was anything different from what young people go through now other than geography. Uh, yeah. Try to stay out of trouble with the police. Uh, experimentation with all types of new things that you come to know about and you begin to choose preferences. Uh, some of us got married. I was fortunate that uh, the people I had around me in my house uh, weren't uh, uh, promiscuous in the sense that uh, we cared about, we had really, if I had a girlfriend, I was going to know her parents. I, I was going to treat her good. Uh, everyone that was important to her was going to be important to me. I was going to let her know my mother. You know, everything had to be above board. But by the time, you so, uh, between ages of 16 and 18, uh, I did some things that I would I didn't do twice. So okay, okay. But by the time and, I yeah. got to the eight, by the time I got to the to Navy age, I pretty much knew that I wanted to see something. I wanted to do some things that mm. simply weren't available in Chicago. And like I say, I listened to this guy that was in Na Jimmy Hardiman. Yeah, I listened to him tell his stories about the Navy. He might have exaggerated, but he was good. And I determined then and there that I was going to the military. I thought I went home to my mother and she wasn't for it. She right. No, she she done no, you 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 no. It wasn't even a discussion. Now I mean, I, I want to get back to that because I, I, I would love to kind of maybe uh, unpack why she had trepidation around you joining the, the armed forces, maybe specifically the Navy. Um, but I guess before that, uh, in terms of kind of religious sensibility um, in, 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 you know, you growing up, what was that like? You know, when I was young, uh, when I say young, before the ages of 13, I was a regular Sunday school. I go to Sunday school, Bible class all the competitive type events, you know, who it is, who was that? I do that. But by the time I got in high school, I was still a, a deeply religious person, but I wasn't in the church. I didn't okay. go to church as much. I, uh, no, rarely at all. But I always uh, talk to God. Even, I mean, it's, it was, that's been a thing in my life, all my life, because not having a father in the home, my father was in the, um, a veterans hospital. He was what you call shell shocked. Now they call it post traumatic stress. But he was shell shocked to this to the extent that he had to be hospitalized. And from, we only was saw him from World War Two or, or War, Korea. World War Two. World, World War Two. Okay. What? What? Well, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it was World War Two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was. He was. He was. I, I'd be seeing him. When I was five or six, and that would have been uh, Korea, 52, uh, I was seeing him from the hospital during those times. So it must have been World War II. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that, you know, that would have been the right. He was born you, in right. like 16. Yeah, he right. probably was World War II. You're and, right. Uh, Which would have ago, been right. Years ago, I could have told you immediately, but I don't know why. I'm not certain anymore. No, no. Uh, World War II would have ended uh, a couple of years before you were born, 40, right? Or 45, right? 45 exactly oh uh, yeah yeah so so you were born 47 I I'd, I'd ask my brothers or sisters but oh, no. let's say I was just curious. World War II or Korea it wasn't World War one and it wasn't Vietnam and when you say shell shock you're talking about physical injuries or more more no, um, uh, 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 neurological uh mm. emotional mental type uh relational lack of uh context uh mm. not really knowing what's actually happening mm. you oh, know uh, interpreting the space altogether differently than most people. So, like you said, you you, you sort of grow up in an, with the absence of a of a of a father figure. You did you did mention no, a not a father figure, a though. father. I had father. Figures. A father. Oh, okay, yeah. So the paternal grandfather who owned the uh, grocery store um, was he kind of that that father figure, or there were others? Up. That was okay. really good. I, he was the he was the kind of. Eh, the dark lord type thing, my father's <laughs> father. But my mother's father was the was a shining bright star. Taught all of his grandsons how to paint, how to mm. uh, do certain things. They were different as night and day. But they really afforded uh, an opportunity to see how different people can be and yeah. still be and still be related to you. <laughs> 
No, I mean, <laughs> hey, my, yeah, yeah. my father's father, hey, you, you don't ask for, I mean, you, you, he had, he owned the grocery store, but he was, he, he also ran an under, underground numbers game. I never knew what those pieces of paper were until I got a little older and wasn't, I'd go down there, but he was a, a hard disciplinarian. He maybe hit me maybe once, but he was good for uh, uh, putting the threat down. My other grandfather was more loving and caring, not talking love, but showing uh, caring type things, you know? Yeah. And I wouldn't give up. I wouldn't trade either one of the experiences. And I love old Lewis Henderson, but he was a different type character. That was the name of your paternal grandfather? Yeah, Lewis Henderson. Okay. Okay. No, we won't. Yeah. We, we'd love to sort of capture all of that. Um, so I, I, I guess, I mean, how would you then care? Like, so what, well, you mentioned your, your, your mother's hesitation about you joining the, uh, the, uh, the Navy or maybe the armed forces. Was that, was that political? Was that something else? Personal. She doesn't want her sons gone. She, she bought, you know, if, if I had said, mom, I'm getting married. She just said, let me see the girl. But I was talking about doing something that she had absolutely no input in after that right. signature. And That's she just right. she wasn't for me leaving home. You know, my mother wanted her children home. Mm -hmm. so, but for you, there was that drive to experience oh, yeah, I life see the world. Outside, of, outside of Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, I guess you would say, somewhat short lived. You were there a little over a year. One um, year, almost two years. One year, 11 months, 23 days. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah, um, almost two years. How would you? So, minus the trouble you got into in Japan, how would you characterize those? Like it that was a experience? wonderful experience. It was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot electronically. Uh, the places that I had a chance to visit uh, and the people I had a chance to meet, the order I was forced to acknowledge, and the uh, the hope of getting out. I mean, uh, knowing that sooner or later this will be over. And, you know, I realized I'd made a mistake the same night I joined. I called home crying. And back in there, but what my mother said, ain't nothing I could do, son. Ain't nothing I could do. That's, that's what you wanted to do. But I, but, and I said, wow, because it was just different. I wasn't prepared for boot camp. I just wanted the fun part. <laughs> no, I, I, but, you know, boot camp helped me to realize that, that, you know, you can't have one without the other. And I began to, again, once I've re I recognized and accepted the fact that I was part of this group, I'm going to be the best person in this group. So was, I, Japan the, was Japan the only country, the, other, the main other no, country I you went to? No, I, I went to the Philippines. We went to Japan. We went to um, China, Hong Kong. Uh, and I, I, they, like I said, they left me in Japan. They, were, they went to some other country. They were going somewhere else after. But I only got right. a chance to see the Philippines, China, and uh, to the Orient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, n now you mentioned um, uh, off my Hunter's Point. Um, is that where you came out for, 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 for boot camp? No. Let's see. What? Uh, Hunter's Point. And for those who, who are listening, sorry, Hunter's Point is here in, in the San Francisco area. It's a military area. installation near San Francisco. I, Correct. I think I went back to Hunter's Point and see it. My 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 past used to be as, as clear as reading off the screen, but now it's it's shady and it, that's okay. Well, that's it, what we're doing. But it show. used to would bother me, but it doesn't even bother me anymore. But it was it was either because I had to go to electronics training school. No boot camp was. I, I went back to Hunter's Point to get put out. I see. I see, see. That's what it was. I went back to Hunter's Point. I was discharged from Hunter's Point. I did Hunter's boot camp at Great Lakes. And I was assigned to a ship, the Kitty Hawk, that was also uh, West Coast, but West Coast, San Diego primarily. But I joined them when they were overseas. Uh, and some, my only helicopter flight ever was being taken to the uh, ship that I was assigned to, the uh, Kitty Hawk. Understood, understood. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're discharged in the late, I, I, I'm just doing math in 1967, my head. Oct October 67. I mean, I'm September, sure. September 67. Okay. And, and Vietnam is kind of raging at this point, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. But see, I did have my taste of that Vietnam experience because I was on an aircraft carrier. 
it, it, I may start crying. It was so horrible. The, the, uh, we had a, a ship's emergency one evening because some bombs had broken loose in the ammunition bay. They weren't charged, all of them, but at some point, too much uh, a collision could have caused a problem. So we all went down. And they had, a, a for as far as you can see, because an a, a aircraft carrier is maybe 300 yards long, 200, 300 yards long. So as far as you can see, nothing but bombs of different weight categories. The smallest being 250 pounds, the largest oh, wow. maybe 5,000 pounds. And they were just moving all around. And I, 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 don't, I don't ever recall seeing such urgency in people to put something back in order because the, the, the danger of it was so obvious. And, but then after all that was over, then you go down the next day, you see them charging these bombs, putting the loading pins in, loading them up on planes, and you're seeing off in the distance the, the, the lights. And you, and you realize, man, they're killing people. Yeah. And they, right. they didn't care less, man. They, ooh, Americans just, they can, they can, they can kill. They can kill. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. Horrific. That was, uh, uh, that was my experience with the Navy as far as, so and then it, it was short-lived, but it was rich. Because whenever you're confined, it, it's not quite like prison. But it's not much unlike prison because you're not going to do anything outside of the scope of the rules and regulations of that particular facility. The rules for a submarine is different for, than the rules for an uh, aircraft carrier. The rules for a land installation, but wherever it, and ignorance of the law is truly no excuse. You will get in some serious trouble if you get found in the wrong place or in the wrong set of circumstances because, no, you know. You know, oh, ABC, always be careful. You know? So, yeah, it, it, it helped me in a lot of ways because any time back then when I would be in an area where I was willing to participate, I'm also willing to compete. And I'm not going to compete to the loss of anyone. And I'm not going to compete with somebody that ain't competing. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to give my best to the enterprise and, uh, that's what I did with the Navy. They just, see, as far as I'm concerned, they let me down. I didn't let them down. They let me down. That's, that's why yeah. I was able to correct that situation when I got out. Because I, right. didn't, I didn't have to listen, but I, I didn't have to go to D.C., but I went. And I, I appeared before the board. I told them they, you know, they knew I was telling the truth, that they did me wrong. So Right. Um, so then once that, like once you're able to somewhat clear your re clear your name, uh, you're back in Chicago. Uh, is that when you come back to well, Chicago? Well, well, by then I was already in Chicago. I had I had established my I had made Shahada. Like I said, we talking about now. I think seventy two, seventy three. By the time I actually got that uh, reversed, okay. but uh, so we, definitely talk about. I mean, I, I and I always say this on the show. I mean, taking the Shahada is not. An event. It's a process. Um, so, if maybe you could talk us through that process of okay, Islam yeah. and, and, and yeah. what you had. Let happened. me let me start with saying uh, there was one person in ha throughout my entire school career. We were neck and neck always. His name was Samuel Lance. He made sure how to before me. He was Salim Al Nurdin. I knew Islam was real. When Salim made Shahada, because I knew you couldn't fool him. I knew you couldn't fool him. So I, I began studying myself. And I knew, I said, yeah, but it's, I'm, I'm Muslim. I, I didn't have any, it didn't take me but a couple of weeks to realize that I was ready to make Shahada. But the uh, mayor at the time, Sheikh Al Haj Muhammad Umayyad Farooqi. Wait, who, who is that? Could you, could, could you maybe? And and I, I can't help but obviously okay. notice. You have to excuse me because they passed. No, that you're getting emotional away. talking about. Was it the mentor or the, just the experience? Well, I love those people, and we fell out. We were together thirty some years, but we had our difference that what that wouldn't be mended. So I left, but I didn't stop caring about him. I just stopped 
participating. But we had already accomplished everything that we would accomplish. And when I left, that was the end of the community primarily. But in which community? In which community is that? Mosque of Umar. The Mosque okay. of Umar in Rosa. Okay. Um, but I think we would definitely want to hear more about the conversion um, story. Like, yeah, you, this brother, you're, you're this. Well, I say Salim, Salim, when I when Salim accepted Islam, I knew it was real. And like I said, I was already a good Christian. So, and we would go. We, we used to go to church together as little boys. We go to Sunday school. Mm-hmm. He come by my house because it was on the way. And after he did, he wasn't going to church anymore. I was watching him, seeing he was different. And I asked him about it. He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim now. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he told me about it. But like I say, when he, when Salim accepted us, when Sam Nance accepted Islam, I knew <laughs> Islam was real. Yeah. So did you go to a masjid or what was There was, was no ma- there was There was. Yeah. Well, I went to. Yeah, I did go to. I don't even recall what they used to. I think it was a, a, a place that had initials, but even Sharif, the son of Usman Sharif, who wrote a brilliant book about the nation of Islam, it's a pamphlet type. I, I'll, I'll have to locate it at some point. But even Sharif, uh, Sheikh Al Haj Muhammad Umar Farooqi, who was the emir of the community of Masjid Umar or Masajid Umar, North America, because we became uh, located in other places as well. He wouldn't give me shahada. He wanted me to go to someone else that he knew, and that was Ibn Sharif. And it was at a, a facility on 75th Street off of Jeffrey. And it was, like I say, November 14th, 1971. And myself and Michael Duhart. Michael Duhart became Malik Jamal Dawood. He passed away as well. We both made shahada that night. Mm. And I was wondering that night, I said, where will, where will this life take us? Mm-hmm. Because, well, long story short, it really took us on different paths. But he, he came back to the dean, and I was able to coordinate his janazah. But, yeah, so we had, we had a real, real Islamic community. It was uh, the realest thing I've ever been a part of. Mm. Mm. It was an extended family, right. unquestioned leadership. But the problem is, if, if the leadership ain't going by the book, it ain't long. It ain't long. But we was, again, we was peeding, competing to be the best. So it, t- go ahead. What, what, what community was this part of? Was this um, just for our understanding in terms of the, the broader We context? were our own community. It was just us. Okay. We, weren't, we weren't attached to anyone. We weren't a part of wasn't attached to anyone. We were wasn't separated from anyone. We were the mosque of Umar, incorporated, and that that meant something. We had now, maybe twenty families that were available twenty four seven. The children were available. We were. We tried to maintain the responsibility for food, clothing, and shelter for everyone. As a central unit, and if if it, if I was eating, you eating. I mean, we had a food pantry. We had we had a full time school, especially when the school. I forget what year it was. If they went on strike, we didn't care because we already had our school. We didn't want. Uh, we really it gave us the opportunity to win the argument against the parents who wanted to go to public school. Understand. They didn't have a. They didn't have a choice. What was um like? What was there a presence of the nation uh, on, on oh, the yeah, south always, side? Always, of- always, always. Some, yeah. They and it was, it was. Uh, that was really during the time when people were uncertain of who was who. We weren't uncertain, but the the general public didn't know who the real Muslims were. And and, and who was? What wasn't the um? Wasn't Elijah Muhammad? In the south, like on the south side, at yeah, that point? he he was on like seventy third, and he may be five miles from where we were. Okay, but no interaction, like you don't. But no, his people were everywhere. That didn't mean that's where his people were. His people were everywhere, and the beauty of that was that you could you could tell them coming a mile away because you could, they all would be in uniform. 
and we weren't <coughs> we weren't necessarily antagonistic, but we wasn't taking no stuff. I mean, we 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 can interact cordially, but if you go to acting like you the Muslim and we not, we got a problem. That's right. You know, I mean, he dies in seventy three, right? Uh, I think some. I thought it was seven, somewhere between seventy three, seventy five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, uh, so by the time you take Shahada, I mean he's alive. Malcolm has passed, of course, um, but 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 the nation is there, and 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 he's in he's in the south side. Of course, uh, I imagine by then Farrakhan is a figure in the nation. Yeah, see, but Sheikh Al Haj Muhammad Umar Al Faruqi used to be a part of the nation. That I was. His gonna, I, mother okay. is benefited with originating the bean pie. Really? Oh, she could cook. <laughs> oh, yeah, she could cook. She could cook. Umi Umi. Because I mean, I know the origin of the bean pie is 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 the South Side, right? Oh, yeah, boy, boy, she. Well, you you probably hear. I'm certain you hear the story from a number of people. But Umi cooked the bean pound like anybody else. But long story short, they. No, no, no. I I don't want you to long story that one. Uh, tell us the long story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, Umi Umi Al Faruqi was the mother of Sheikh Al Hajj Muhammad Umi Al Faruqi. Okay. She was the uh, accepted grandmother of the community of the mosque of Umar. Beautiful. People stand up when she come in. I mean, we had, she was respected and she carried herself with respect. Mm -hmm. And he was her only child. You're talking about a spoiled child. That was, that, that really went up in the problem. <laughs> she passed away before it all happened, but yeah, he was a, he was a very smart guy. He was uh he was he was a good he was good until he wasn't. And for the most part he was. That's why I don't but mind it's, it's, it sounds like he was speaking, part of the I don't mind speaking favorably about him, but I couldn't do it until he passed. This was a this was a brother who was part of the Nation of Islam and then broke off and oh, then yeah. became the leader of the the Masjid Omar you're referring to. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Interesting. No, it, is this any it, like at that at this point? It, is there any uh, community that is associated with Imam Warthin Muhammad? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, he always had shattered acceptance. His acceptance grew, even Understood. even myself. I, hit, I went to his janazah. I got a picture with me and Sheikh Tijani from his janazah. But he grew in, in acceptance because regardless of whether or not you followed him, you believed he was sincere. You mean Imam Warthin Muhammad? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, not uh, <laughs> I was actually I was actually at that janazah as well. I was fortunate to be there in Chicago when he passed. Um, Wow. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned Sheikh Tijani. So so I, I guess going back to the community then, um, uh, you are one of the founding kind of, I mean, yeah, one of the founding. I was the founding yeah. imam of Masjid Umar. Right. There you go. There you go. Um, and, and, and so, to, I mean, I guess kind of to Omar's point, although you may not be affiliated uh, with kind of a national community or organization, I guess in terms of if there is a, such a thing as in terms of an ideology or an approach, I mean, it's certainly Sunni Islam, but. Oh, absolutely. And we did. Would you me, we did that? We, excuse me. We did consider ourselves connected to the larger community. Absolutely. Okay. But, uh, in spite of what they were doing, we would clear it for ourselves. We Understood. weren't, we weren't following anyone else's leadership, mm. even if we were wrong. Okay. We were, I mean, no, I mean, that's just where it was. We, we, we would rather be wrong together than right following somebody we didn't know. So, I mean, that, 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 however that sounds, that's the way we were. Right. And and, and so uh, he, I don't know much about Chicago in the late 60s or early 70s. I mean, other, I mean, it, which is sad because my father actually was there at the time. Um, but he spent, I and mean, that was the first place he immigrated to. But if you could maybe... Any interactions going on with the by then growing immigrant community? Oh, in absolutely! Chicago? Oh, absolutely! We always had tremendous support and brotherhood from the uh, Muslim community, all the Muslims in America. But generally, the ones we would have uh, most intimate relationships with were Indo-Pakistanis, Egyptians, Turks. Whenever you could find them, but back in those days, you didn't have many Turks. 
You have okay. them recently, but early on you didn't have but one here and there. But they would always be glad uh, to meet us and see us and that we had so much support because they saw that we were really trying to practice Islam. We said, but masjid, we did all, they, oh, they give us money for carpets. They would, they would always look out for us as best they could. We were on the, uh, the, the, the Eid committees and, uh, MCC, especially because MCC, when it was on 16, uh, 1600 North Kedzie. So, you, you know, it's interesting. So right. as, as, as my, my take, you know, Listening to the story, I think there's a conception, a misconception out there that um, most of the um, most of the African American community did not practice Sunni Islam until after uh, Imam Waradin Muhammad took the nation of Islam to that direction. But but you're telling a completely different oh, that's uh, an untold story. Conception. That's an yeah, yeah. Conception. He it became more popular, mm -hmm. but it was already active and thriving. There was already a thriving Muslim community, but they didn't get the press. They weren't seeking the press. Like they said, well, what we're trying to do is, is worship. But there was something about the nation of Islam that attracted attention. Mm -hmm. and, and it looked like they wanted attention, the way they dressed, the way they carried themselves. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the regular Muslim was a nine to five, Yuli guy. Trying to get off, trying to make some arrangements to go to Juma. <laughs> you know, if you can get Juma off work, or if you, you, many of them didn't even. We didn't try to get Juma. We try to have lunch for Juma time, and you just stretch your lunch. You'll get late to Juma. But, right. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah. No. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and, and I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, uh. Like, you know, I, I'm glad you cleared up that misconception, although, I mean, I, I would hope, you know, like we have had get, like past guests on the show who we, and we've gotten into detail about some of the other, you know, sort of um, intersecting movements and, and so on that informed, you know, the practice of the black American community, you know, even uh, disassociated with the nation of Islam entirely. Um, going back to what you were talking about with regards to the interactions with the growing immigrant community in, in, in Chicago, um, any kind of notable, you, you, you just sort of talked, you, you just started talking about MCC, but um, any other kind of notable either organizations or individuals? Yeah, Islamic, uh, the I'm Islamic Medical Association of North America, Dr. Malik. Uh, whew, they, the, some people were just regular supporters. All we have to do is let them know we were trying to do this, that, or the other. But every established, I mean, but it, there weren't. It, it, could we remember when uh, Abdul Hamid Doga used to be at the Muslim Community Center before, well, they went, before they went to the Islamic Foundation? So we were around that long. So, Doctor, I mean, so yeah, Abdul Hamid Dogar, for example, I mean, just a just a pillar of that community, um, and and certainly had a lot of interactions with Imam Warthin Muhammad, with yes. I imagine with yes. just everyone. Yes. Um, if you could talk about him, I mean, he's been mentioned on the show in the past. He was imam at MCC prior to Islamic Foundation. No, I don't. I don't recall him being imam, but he was always a mover and shaker. Whether he was a president or a member of the board, whatever it was, if Abdul Hamid Doga didn't go for it, it wasn't moving forward yet. He would wow. come early. He would stay late. He would do what needed to be done. He would do what was unpopular. And that was get in your face. He didn't like getting in your face, but when he got in your face, he was in your face. And it That's was right. and it was usually about something that he was unclear on. He wasn't saying you were wrong. Just clear me up, brother. <laughs> Make it acceptable for me. And I had more of those interactions than I, I liked, but I enjoyed my relationship with Abdul Hamid Doga, and I always uh, tried to remain respectful even though I'd want to maintain my ground. And yeah, Abdul Hamid Doga was a, a, is a person that should be remembered because he was, uh, his input was remarkable. And he was sincere Correct. in his, and in, in, in dedicated to the establishment of Islam as a way of life. I, I didn't see him so much. Now behind the scenes, he might've had a cultural thing, but he didn't present it when he was dealing with us. It was just Absolutely. Islam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, I mean, just anecdotally, he, 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 because we had my father's janazah in 2008 uh, at the foundation, Islamic foundation, he actually led the prayers 
Um, and, and he did something very, uh, you know, I don't want to get into it, but he was just a remarkable person and, and just so forth, you know, just so um, approachable and uh, always kind of defer to the family in those kind of situations. Um, and so I have, a, I have a great deal of respect for him and his legacy. Uh, in fact, his son, Harun, listens to the show. So uh, kind of a special shout out to Harun yeah, Dogar. Yeah. Um, um, but um, but um, um, if you uh, is, is, is AIC, American Islamic wow. College, is that, is that Ooh, growing? Man. We helped get that started. Dr. Okay. Saka, we moved. We physically moved things when they first secured the building. We had, Beautiful. We had a we had a brother that didn't quite understand that they weren't getting rid of everything, so he took the curtains. And Doctor Talker, they called and they said, "Did you uh, have you seen the curtains?" So let us check. We get him. So yeah, we we helped uh, set up that building because we were always very close with Doctor Saka. because he yeah, was in, he's the one that secured the American Islamic College. Correct. So again, for those listeners who may not be as familiar with Chicago, uh, one, you're mentioning Dr. Ahmed Sucker, who I imagine even beyond Chicago, he was a known, a notable figure. Um, again, may God have mercy on him too, because he has passed as well. Um, but yeah, Dr. Sucker um, uh, and, 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 and started, was one of the starters or founders of AIC, American Islamic College, which is on the north side of Chicago, um, was Dr. Uh, Hamid... What, I'm, Dr. Ahmed Zaki Hamid. Hamad. Ah, Ahmed Zaki Hamid. Uh, he was around, but no, he wasn't he wasn't as involved. Dr. Basul, you know, Asad Basul. Th- that's right. Dr. Basul. Uh, and that was a Dr. Hussein. And <sighs> brother, he he has he's almost blind. I, I I can't I don't recall his name. He used to be from the MCC. But uh but yeah, we were involved in helping get it established. And uh, we were less involved after Dr. Soccer because it became uh, controlled and influenced by the Turks as well, which is good because they, they run a good program. So we haven't had, we didn't have as much. And like I said, I, set, I stopped my community-based activity in 2009. I became personally I remain personally connected to different places, but I no longer represented the mosque of Umar anywhere. Okay. 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 But throughout uh, the seventies, you were, you were, you were leading. 80s, leading. 90s, up to 2009. That's right. Let's, let's talk, let's talk about some of the events that occurred in the late seventies and the eighties. Well, first, and the 90s. first of all, I wanted to quickly just thank you for, for that little insight into the, or giving us a little bit of a, of a picture of what, you know, of what's happening in Chicago uh, at that time. Um, but I think one of the things Omar wanted to pivot to specifically, and Omar, I, I don't want to speak for you. So if you wanted to maybe take us there. Uh, yeah, sure. So no, I'm just in reading your bio. Um, you talked about 1978, spending time overseas studying. And I, I'd love to hear about that because it's a completely different experience, right? Uh, I know you spent time, of, of course, uh, with the I Navy. Good overseas. fortune as well. I also made Hodge in 1977, but I felt I was so mistreated. I didn't even get to Medina because they they took our money. When we got there, they charged us a landing fee and this, that, and the other. We had $1,000. And by the time they finished, we had $300. And so I was ready to get home. So I came home without going to Medina, and the emir said, you what? You didn't give a sound salam to Rasulullah. So I said, oh, yeah, the brother told me we could send salam from where we were. And he would get it. He said, well, that, that's not the same, son. You were a bus ride away. So I made my intention. I asked Allah. I prayed. And as far as I'm concerned, the imam training program was a result of my prayers because mm-hmm. it came up the next year. And uh, it didn't start in Saudi Arabia. It started in Naperville. But they were going to choose 10 out of the 50 people from Naperville to go to Saudi Arabia. And I figured I could be one of those 10. Hmm. But like I was talking a little bit. Yeah, as I teased at the outset, you know, Imam Siraj talked a little bit about that when he was on the show. But I'd love to hear from you more details. So who organized this in Naperville? Who were some of the maybe 50 Dr. people? Dr. again. Uh, I don't know who all did it, but the Ministry of Higher Education was the Saudi part. Okay. And Ahmed Saker informed our community 
that they were interviewing. Mm -hmm. I don't know who was coordinating it all, but in the end of it all, only myself and Sheikh Khalil Abdul Rafia were there from Chicago. And uh, I missed. So what was that like? Yeah. I missed Behold so badly when, because they didn't set up an interview for me. I just found out where they were and I busted in like I had control of something. And but like I say, when we were from the mosque of Umar, we really felt like we had that right. And if you didn't give us our consideration, we felt we had a right to confront you. So I confronted the uh, sheikhs from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I remember one of them, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Rashid from the um, uh, uh, Jamia to Malik Abdul Aziz in Mecca. He was in the room next door. And he heard me misbehaving in the room with the other Arabs. I was laying all on their bed. I was, and he came, he came in and he just looked around and he left out. So, and then that, and I, I came to myself and I caught, we uh, communicated and I left. And then the word came down, okay, as far as the people from Chicago, you can have anybody from Chicago except that Imam Ibrahim. So the emir said, you go anyway. So I went anyway. And they said, your name is not on there. I said, well, it should be. And they let me stay. And they let me stay. And I I behaved so well, they didn't believe that I was the same person that had misbehaved before. But like I told them, we felt that they had overlooked us wrongly. And we came about the knowledge of their being there other than through the front door. I mean, you should, we should have heard that from you. But long story short, I don't know why I say that. They still, uh, they accepted <laughs> me uh, into the program. I enjoyed the program. Like I say, Siraj Wahaj was in the program. Like I say, first we started in Naperville. What was the, uh, so tell us a little bit more about the purpose of that program. It, it was like the Imam training program. They wanted to, uh, uh, they launched an effort to normalize or standardize the imam training so that they would have a confidence that the, and they would provide us with materials and everything uh, that uh, Wahhabi type stuff, you know what I mean? That they would just give you everything they wanted you to have. And most of it was within the, the, the boundaries of what we would be doing anyway. Okay. So, I, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so, so the material, the, the curriculum, as it were, the content was coming from the ministry. Correct. Okay. Um, but at that time, I guess the geopolitical nature of Wahhabi, like Wahhabism, I mean, was that even a, a, like a blurb on Not the radar? Really. Not really. No, it right. was, it was, right. it was, uh, if it, it was there, but it wasn't right. out front. They exactly. Used, they read, they used general materials. I mean, you couldn't yeah. tell. You couldn't tell one from the other. And right. uh, like I said, elementary teachings of Islam, uh, uh, they, they had standard materials, five or six books that they would use initially. And then after a while, they'd send you uh, Tafsir of Ibn Kathir in the 10 volumes. They'd make sure you had uh, enough copies of the Quran that, that, are, that says uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education in Saudi Arabia in them. Okay. And uh, they keep but was there was there anything in there where uh, you saw it and you go hmm no, this is no, a little no, different than no, no I won't I won't I, I never came across anything that was objectionable and some hmm. some things were clearly opinionated but opinionated is not necessarily objectionable they didn't try to sell it as this is the way it is it was an opinion so. correct correct um and so how long was that training or or the portion of the training in Saudi Arabia that was three months as well. Three months. And it, it was three months in Mecca, specifically? No, Mecca and Medina. Well, we went all over. We went to Mecca, Medina, Taif, Riyadh. Anywhere that they considered important, they took us. Okay. Okay. We went to the uh, historic places, uh, all of the sites that were mentioned in Quran. And uh, yeah, we went everywhere they could take us. 
and 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 so what what was the program or the ministry's focus specifically on uh American imams? Yes, you everyone know? in the program was American. Well, I mean, but I say America, I'm including the the islands. Cuz I think there were a couple of people from the islands uh what West Indies uh Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, but in terms of, I, I guess, um, uh, racial or, or, uh, backgrounds, it was a couple of white guys, but mostly African-American, mostly African-American. Okay. Do you know if that was deliberate? Or was that just, I think by that, way that's of- all they had to choose from. <laughs> I mean, that, that's all that was available. They probably would have taken more white people if they could have found them, but it was only a couple. I mean, right, from right. anywhere, but, I think they recognized based on the opposition or the opposite that they needed to deal with black folks. Okay. okay. Because the and nation of Islam was black folks and, and they were uh, in a, in a, in a very real subtle way, they had opposition to the nation of Islam because they, you know, they had a, you know, they, they had a very dismissive, how do you even consider these people? Right. But right. when they saw that they were in fact really considered, they couldn't get around them either. How how did you navigate that? I mean, because I don't I don't I don't sense a cert, a sense of dismissal from you, like, or people that I've spoken to, like. So how how but but you were there. So how did you how were you how were you and maybe some of the other imams? And of course, you know, everyone took it differently. Like I know Imam Siraj's journey may be unique, but and different than yours. Um, but. How how were you all able to navigate that, knowing that, you know, that might not be the sort of opinion or the position that you would follow vis-a-vis the nation or or any or any of the other opinionated as you as you as you phrased it, um, you know, uh, things that you were getting from the content from the curriculum. I I didn't have a problem with it. It was always clear to me that okay. uh, you know they were mistaken, and I see it. And if it, they didn't believe that. It wasn't my job to convince them that they were. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even enter into the argument. It, it wasn't. A, we can. If we're going to do something, we're doing something based on a on a common acceptance. We're feeding people. We we we're trying to get some people some jobs. We're housing people. But other than that, we're not here to talk about uh, religion. Because I've no. I, I am dismissive of the the the, the doctrine, but sure, I'm not sure. dismissive of the people. There you go. You know, I'm not dismissive of the people, That's and. Right. Uh, so we don't even need, I, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, respectfully talk about the doctrine. Uh, of course. And I, and I understand that completely. Um, and so, so now we're talking late seventies, um, uh, and you're still continuing to serve out as imam in the, uh, Morgan park community. Roseland, 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 Roseland sorry, Roseland, Roseland community. Um, it, it may mean nothing to, uh, but it's a big difference. Well, tell Roseland, us about that. Roseland, see, but let me tell you how we ended up in Roseland. Okay. In 1973, there was a gas leak in one of the industrial facilities out far south. They evacuated Oakdale Gardens, which was where we were, which was about 10,000 people. They evacuated, they, they evacuated the entire housing project. Now, we already had a piece of property in Roseland and an interest in some other. So we decided that that was our time to leave because we helped coordinate along with the fire department and the police and the other officials. We helped coordinate the movement of the people and the resources to the people because when you move 10,000 people, they got to have the next meal or at least the meal after the next meal. You don't want to miss them too much. So they had, we had we help coordinate the meals and the placement and the uh, movement of the people from Algel to these other sites. But we pretty much left Algel as a uh, base of operations with that gas leak and moved into Roseland. When we moved into Roseland, Roseland has a commercial strip, which is uh, all of the uh, popular retail shops. And it's about two miles long, maybe three miles long. And we were able to situate ourselves within this strip in what ended up being three buildings side by side. We started off with one building, 1405 South Michigan. Then we were able to purchase 1407 
and won 1409 South Michigan. The Masjid was in 1405. Uh, we had five times Salat, Salatul Juma, uh, uh, Iftar, and uh, sometimes Sahur, always Iftar, sometimes Sahur in Ramadan. And uh, my family always lived over the Masjid. So, yeah, wow. And, and, and so as we come into the 1980s, I, and I just want to um, really under, try to understand how things are coming and moving along in time here. But how did the community evolve? What did you see in the 80s? Any, any, big, any uh, strong memories from the 80s as we move in through time into the 90s? Surprisingly, uh, not, not much, because we were um, in a very real way separated from the larger uh, uh, community, not Muslim community, the larger geographic community, because we didn't want our children necessarily associating with other people's children. We didn't want our wives. We didn't want to become familiar on that level. We wanted you to know that if you need some food, you can come get some food. If you need some counsel, you can get some consultation. But we're not trying to be friends with non-Muslims. We weren't trying to spend time with non-Muslims in settings that weren't of our design. We, 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 we saw ourselves as a genuine benefit to ourselves and others. And, and all we had to do was hear about a need existing and we would compete with saying who could fill that need. That was number 16, find a need and fill it. I mean, no, and that's what we developed over a period of time. We developed systems and uh, acronyms and like we were the MOI. The MOI met every Monday night at seven o'clock until nine o'clock in uniform. The uniform changed over the years based on what was available. It started out white shirt, black tie, black slacks. It ended up white band collar shirt because band collars weren't available in the early 70s and maybe 80s. But then it turned out being band collars and or you can wear a thobe. But you had to show that you intentionally dressed for MOI. And MOI stood for Men of Islam, and it was a uh, a class that was established for the purpose of normalizing and standardizing what we understood Men of Islam to be. Mm. You know, we do this, we don't do that. Uh, so I mean, and, and was, I guess uh, probably. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I guess probably you're having kids and kid. The, the, that's being a parent is probably very much influential in some of this. Right? Well, say, yeah, kids growing up. yeah. My, my oldest son was born in 1975. So, yeah, we we had children at the time and they just became B.O.I. or C.O.I. Boys of Islam or children of it. I know, really, we, we we took we took it. Very, we, we took it serious that we could not or we were not a part of the regular or mainstream way of American life. We would like for a, home, a lot of homeschooling. Well, it, mostly homeschooling. only after the uh, we had before homeschooling, we had supplemental programs. But when the schools shut down totally, we went full time homeschool. And uh, matter of fact, we're still homeschooling in many cases. But uh, and Corona did that for us. It allowed us to begin homeschooling our grandson because, no, I mean, when children are five, six, let me tell you how my daughter became homeschooled. She was going to preschool, and I'd walk up to the preschool every day and get her. She was about three or four, and we were in the bathroom uh, washing her hands, and little boy came in the bathroom, sat down, used the bathroom, got up and left. I said, whoa, this ain't going to work. You know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to change the way they do things, but I wasn't yeah. going to return her to that system because it's very difficult to. Un I didn't want to have something I got to undo. That's right. That's so, right. I mean, that's enough. Yeah, that's that, that. That's just way much, way much more work than you signed up. Yeah, for. And the little boy, um, did, the little boy didn't mean no harm. I didn't have no reason to say nothing to him whatsoever. Other than right. hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you said your oldest was born in 1975. Now, now so, so then you you must have gotten married uh, a few years after your shahada. Then, yes. As a matter of um, fact, that was no. there were only a couple of women available. Because uh, when I say a couple of women available, there were only a couple of Muslim women, and we were not considering any non-Muslim women at the time. Even though I had a 
a woman that I had previously been associated with, she did, had not accepted Islam necessarily. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, but I, so long ago. Uh, no, no, I was, that's fine. My, 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 my oldest child is a product of my second marriage. My first marriage to, was to a woman who we were non-Muslims together. And there's some real foolishness. But we came into Islam together and we, we accepted Islam and some, she's still Muslim. And we, we separated because she didn't want to have children necessarily. And I did. And that's your oldest. And then, and then, um, because I, I've, I've met your wife, um, and, and she's my when you, third, I've been married four times. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I have um, one wife presently. <laughs> well, I did have two at one time, but okay, uh, right. I, I have one life present. That's all I want. Thank you. Right, right. I, I guess I mean since you since you brought up the issue, and I didn't know that. Uh, I, I didn't know all this. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the prevalence, or maybe not prevalence of of, of polygamy. Uh, uh, you know, in the community, at least the South Side Muslim community. But, you know, or well, back in the day, I think can, it may be it may be prevalent that. now. I don't even try well, to keep up. Okay. But, okay. Uh, we only considered it when there was a sister who wanted to be married, who needed to be married, or who had children who, who who had children who could benefit from the aid of a male input, and that's the only way you can legitimately uh, insert a man into that those children's lives. You know, marry him to the mother. You can't just you know he can't he gonna. Ha adopt some role outside of a, a, a traditional family posture. So if the brother wants to marry the sister, the sister's uh, willing, fine. We didn't force anything, but we preferred marriage because marriage is a type of a commitment that's automatically community oriented. But you got a, a single person, and they can be very, very flighty, not intentionally. They're just not tied down to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, because I mean, and the reason I raise that issue is just as by way of observation, and, and you may disagree. And in fact, if you whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on it. Um, the way the way I, I, I've sort of come to come to or like I said, the way I've sort of analyzed the situation is, is that I, I think that in the African-American community, black American community, and of course, the Arab community, because of their own sort of, you know, because of how things are back home there's a certain acceptability around polygamy that is perhaps not as prevalent in the South Asian community. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and, and that's interesting because a generation or two ago, there was acceptance in the South Asian community. Is that right? Uh, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, Omar and I are both related and, 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 and our, our, our great grandmother was one of a, you know, uh, she was in a polygamous relationship. Let's say she was, she was one of the wives. marriage, so to speak. There you go. There you go. Um, so, but, but that has since dissipated, uh, over the generations. However, the general acceptability around it is, I think, inarguably more prevalent among Arabs and among the black community. So I, as a, so could you maybe again, talk about it in terms of where that acceptance comes from in the black community uh, that one may not find in, like I said, other communities. I don't know where it came from, but I always wanted more than one. I mean, they, they, when I, oh, that was, that was one of the attractive elements. What? Oh, oh <laughs> man. And I think, I think that's the African-American response. That's my response. What? Legally? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, now, I, I like, I like that idea. Was that ever was that ever uh, promulgated by the nation? Was that discouraged by the nation? I don't I don't know what they talked about behind closed doors. But I'm just I curious. I know you. Don't, I don't need. I don't know. Curious. I don't know if marriage being a discussion amongst them. Period. Okay. Okay. Understood. Yeah, plural understood. marriage, polygamy. No, I don't. I, well, I, I I could say right off, it's not something they would do. They would have done. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess since you've talked about, you know, like. Your marriages. Um, I mean, how many children do you have? I've only met a few I have of them. So that's four that are still living. Idris passed away in uh, 2014. Your oldest, the, the oldest. No, the second to the oldest. Amas. Okay, I'm, I'm Amas is the oldest. They were my children with Jamila Akbar. Okay, and I'm uh, sorry about the loss of your son. Uh, um, 
Uh, with Om Jamali, Hanifa, Tauba, Ibrahim, I have three children. Jamali is the oldest son, then Ismail and Aisha. Uh, Tahir is uh, the youngest son, but he's older than Aisha. And he's the son with uh, Asma Abdul Jabbar, who was a child of one of the founding families of the Mosque of Umar. Oh, mashallah. Okay. Okay. No, thank you for that. And the only reason I ask is, like I said, I, I've only met Jamali, Ismail, and Aisha. Um, in, in fact, you know, um, just a quick shout out to Aisha because Aisha listens to the show and, and, and uh, she, she actually was instrumental in putting us in touch with each other. So I want to thank her for that. Um, and I guess worth noting, um, or if you wanted to talk about it, and again, only because uh, I know the, the, that she got married at Talif um, and that she got married to Sheikh Hamza's son. Yes. Yeah, that was, uh, was it 2017, I believe? Was, uh, I think 17, so. 18. It's 17 yeah, or 18. I, yeah, I yeah that's right. 17 sounds closer. That's right, because she was here at Zaytuna, and she graduated right. from Zaytuna College. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, congrats, I guess belated congratulations on that marriage. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> Ibrahim's a wonderful young man. Yes, he is. Um, yes, he is. Um, Ibrahim being your son-in-law as well. And of course your last name, not to confuse all of that, but, <laughs> um, yeah. So I was talking to you generally about kind of your opinion, you know, in terms of the, uh, in terms of polygamy being, uh, more widespread and, and, and why, if any, if you have any thoughts on why that is more acceptable in the black community. Uh, like I said, it was from the time I heard about it, it's something I wanted to participate in. And mm -hmm. all of the brothers that I knew uh, were very favorable, favorably disposed to that. Now, the sisters uh, were not as favorably disposed, but the brothers were, all of them looked forward to it. But many of the sisters would, were not. They didn't think that a uh, man could take care of one. So why are you trying to get two? But the, the, the men weren't thinking of taking care of past uh, minimal taking care of. We just It was just something attractive about the proposition. Right. Now, as imam, though, did you encounter those cases where you would have to step in as imam and, and, and you know, sort of, you know, address those issues of inequality? No, we, had very few, we had very few participants. Okay. okay. Even though you may have been, uh, wanted, you just didn't have the... Uh, uh, opportunity availability within the environment that we were in because the brothers were marrying one sister at a time and you, you know we wouldn't we wouldn't have been favorably disposed to a brother marrying two wives when another brother didn't have one mm -hmm. and, um i guess we could transition if you don't mind imam um thank you for that um into perhaps something more uh in the more recent past and that is um i know when we talk about the South side of Chicago, at least now, uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about Iman um, and, and the role of Iman in that community. Um, so maybe could you talk a little bit about, I mean, either your involvement directly or just sort of Iman's presence into the community. You don't have to give us a history. I mean, inshallah, one of these days we'll have Rami on to talk about all of that. But, um, you know, well, I'd Iman, love to hear is, Iman has become uh, through sweat, and labor equity, the premier Muslim representative organization in Chicago, as far as I'm concerned, they uh, find a need and they fill it. They uh, are easy to work with. Uh, no big eyes, a little use. Uh, they promote a sense of uh, community. And uh, they're, they're constantly addressing some uh, new or continuum or growing issue. They have their food fair, or I forget the name of the building that they're opening up, I think, in the next couple of months. I mean, major installations that affect entire neighborhoods. Mm. And I give credit to Rami in a very real sense because he's such a, a easy personality to deal with. And, uh, and leadership needs to be that, you know, they need to be approachable. And, uh, and Rami has always been that. Now he's Dr. Nasha Shibri, but I remember when, <laughs> when they first started, we used to meet out at the Mosque of Umar on uh, uh, irregularly, but uh, you know, fairly regularly, but not consistently. And many of the old timers are still involved. Uh, I'm talking Malik, Abdul Malik Ryan. He's not an old timer, but he's the. Uh, he used to be involved uh, in Iman early days as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, would you say? And again, I'm I'm not privy to all of the history, but just knowing Rami personally, I I can imagine this being the case where, you know. 
by way of maybe advice even, not to Rami, I'm just mean to other maybe community organizations that enter into a space that they haven't been historically, you know, what was kind of Rami's approach and, and like you said, Iman's approach to existing community and working with those institutions as opposed to kind of coming in and being the, you know, okay, l- let us show you how it's, how it's really they meant. acknowledged they acknowledged and sought out the uh, players, people okay. that had uh, invested interests. They acknowledged them, sought them out, gave them a platform and 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 an operating role within uh, what they could bring to the table. They never tried to be everything to everybody, but they tried to be as inclusive as possible. Matter of fact, it, it seemed like the more the merrier. Sometimes to me, it seemed like they have too many people. But they tried to facilitate for whoever wants to participate. And for those people who may not want to participate, but they feel it's applicable to their circumstances. Yeah. I mean, that organization has seen significant growth. I mean, they are now. I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm not I'm impressed all... with too many organizations, but I'm impressed with you, man. Yeah. They My are... son and daughter in law worked there, as a matter of fact. Your son and daughter-in-law? And okay. daughter-in-law, yes. Uh, Jamali and his wife? Jamali and Sadia. Okay, okay. Uh, I've met both of them as well. Uh, they're directly involved with the organization. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 40 hour week, 40 hour, I mean, full-time job type thing. That's right, that's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, mashallah. I mean, yeah, th- that organization has grown, as I said, considerably over the years. They, they, they've, they uh, I think they operate with a multi-million dollar kind of budget, and uh, they've done remarkable work. Um, I think they're turning things down nowadays as opposed to, I think they've been sought for this uh, massive coronavirus uh, vaccine thing, but that's... Uh, uh, oh, really? To help facilitate the rollout? Yeah, at uh, Comiskey Park. Ah, that's amazing. Oh, really? So to actually like give injections to get trained on giving injections well, I, well, and whatnot. Well, I'm I'm maybe talking out of class, but yeah, I think yeah. The, the general okay. idea to help facilitate. They're trying to yeah, find organizations that are willing to take on. That's a tremendous responsibility. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah. And so how, I, how, how have you been, by the way, with the co- with the COVID? Uh, how's that been? Alhamdulillah. I mean, we I do yeah. an occasional juma. I did the juma at, at Talif and. Uh, uh, interview last week, but you know, I, I, we basically take care of grandchildren and stay uh, away from crowded places. <laughs> okay, right. good. Um, so, w- I guess what uh, what lies ahead beyond? I mean, you know, once things sort of return to somewhat normal, um, you know, you have relocated to a new community. What does that look like? I mean, are you looking to just sort of like? these are your twilight years and you're going to spend time with family or are you looking to get back into being, you know, being back into the community and being involved? A mixture of the two, a mixture of the two, a mixture of the two. I'm really enjoying my grandsons, but I'm also enjoying sharing what was, you know, and, and that's mostly what I like to bring to the table. Now the historical reality of what Islam used to be like, you know, and, and what we were prepared to go through and what we went through and the difference between now and then. And, uh, I always wanted to consider myself an active participant, but I actually really feel as though, you know, the, the heyday is, 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 is what was in my life. So because, what do you think uh, is the, go ahead. you know, go ahead. I want to hear are you comment on a couple of things. I finished your thought, but I want to ask you. But because the mosque uh, Umar won't to. return. And if you weren't there, you wouldn't, you really wouldn't know what it was. And it's, that's, that's sad for me because it was, it was something that met the need. Yeah, no, you referred to kind of the, the how things were versus how they are now. What, what, what do you think is the biggest difference for Muslim youth, um, the biggest difference from before and, unity, and maybe the biggest challenge? Unity, unity. I mean, a sense of togetherness. I went to Juma yesterday at Masjid Hassan. It felt good, and it was uh, quite a few people there, and they were trying to distance and wear masks. But uh, as much as we felt connected, we didn't feel together. You know, and it's a difference when you have a, a, a house full of children without parents and a house full of children with a parent. See, and, and leadership is important, you know, and a rec- and accepted leadership. And that's what I come to record. It's important, especially in a situation like ours, when you got 40 or 50 people. They have a, they have a, 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 a need to be able to look to a place for a sense of direction or understand what is the standard sense of direction. And that's all I saw was uh, we were all on the same team, but didn't nobody know who was playing what position. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the Muslims are, 
uh, we are la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But if I, if you were to say what we doing next, I don't know. And but we need to know what we doing next. What would you like to see us doing next? I mean, as someone who has the kind of breadth and maintaining scope of- maintaining a, 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 an operational structure. You know, I mean, even if it was loosely done, like once a week you check in. And I mean, you have to have some. And that's what we used to have a a system. When a brother moved from one place to the next, he called and checkpoint. He said, Mom, I'm checkpointing at the masjid. I'm leaving, going to the residence. I mean, we did that. And we had a person for decades, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. His job was to maintain the security post and to write down the movements of the people. I got a log. I got some of them logs around here somewhere. We really, we took all that stuff serious. We wanted to have a, a system that could be replicated anywhere. You know, you don't need to be brainy. You just do this when this, I mean, and then there's just not a coordinated effort. That's what's missing, a coordinated effort. Yeah, it sounds like you're referring to the, the unity, but also just the, the support system for the youth, right? Well, I haven't, I mean, I think that the, the support systems exist. But you don't have the people in place to connect people to them. You know, you got people looking for each other. You know, I I have people every Ramadan, they know they can call me and give me money because I can give money to people. But uh, you have people actually looking for people. You got people with resources, don't know people without resources. And they don't know how to meet people without resources and don't really want to go into those areas where those people are. So there has to be some or needs to be some connecting element that, 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 you know, maintains that sense of connection. And that's what, you know, Zakat committee does relative to Zakat, E committee does relative to E, but we don't have uh, anyone coordinating. Uh, like, I'm not in touch with the youth as I used to be, but the youth that I see, Iman got youth programs, they're, they're trying to find youth. But you don't want the type of order that you have to uh, 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 adhere to when you come into programs. You can't you can't you can't smoke the blunt and then, you know, (laughs) come on into. So it's it's young people want to be young people and and young youth itself suggests freedom of movement. You know, and they don't they're not necessarily interested in sitting up being listening to nobody. The ones that I know, they know everything already. (laughs) <laughs> and structured community can be, yeah, yeah, can be a, can be a, a, a like, like, like an impediment to what they want to get to, right, and what they want to yes. do. So yes. that's always a yes. challenge. I think that remains. That's what they're trying to get away from. They've been, they've been caught up in that for the first thirteen years. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Imam Ibrahim. I, I want to be mindful of the time. I know, I know, we've been going for a while, and and we're pushing up against Maghrib for you. Um, but uh, I, I really want to sincerely thank you for uh, for for taking the time. I mean, you know, you you mentioned so much of the history that, or we we discussed and navigated through so much of the history that I wanted to at least touch on with you because I think you have that breadth. Of, of, of historical experience. Um, and I really want to thank you for that. I mean, that was really the intent of the show from our very beginning to kind of capture stories um, like yours. And so uh, really want to thank you. I, I hope we've made the experience enjoyable and uh, inshallah, if we have the opportunity again to have you back on the show, we'd love to, we'd love to do that. Me too. I, I did enjoy it. And uh, it's it, it just, it's hard to cover forty years in in a, in a couple of hours, but absolutely. And I'll uh, and I, I made notes. Didn't even look at my notes either. Yeah, wow. <laughs> well, you yes, kept. Yeah, but I mentioned head. I mentioned most things on there. Yeah, and and, and you kept. Ref- but I think your memory, mashallah, uh, it, it, was spot on, and and you you remember names, dates, uh, all, all the important stuff. So um, again. Thank you for all of that. And uh, yeah, thank you as always for joining us. And um, I appreciate yeah. you inviting me. And hopefully, inshallah, I look forward to doing it again. Please meet yeah. you, Omar. You are the nice big My daughter's out there, so alhamdulillah. Are you, you two, was, Umber, Reg, are you all right next door to each other? Huh? Yeah, we're, we we're related. We're family. Okay, so I'm gone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it, folks. That's our interview with uh, Imam Ibrahim from Chicago. We hope you enjoyed it. We will, of course, be back with more stories to tell and uh, more interviews 
in the meantime, definitely keep sending us that feedback. You know, we, we want to hear from you in terms of what you're enjoying about the show and, and what you want to hear from the show in the future, uh, future guests and so forth. So send us the feedback on facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. We have a Twitter handle, uh, diffused C at diffuse C. Um, and of course, uh, Gmail, if you if you prefer email us at, uh, Gmail, diffuse congruence at gmail.com and do support our Patreon page, Patreon, uh, forward slash diffuse congruence. So we can continue to bring you content and, um, that it's at the highest quality. So, We'll look forward to being back soon. Take care. Sonic. Thank <laughs> you.